All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Jake Light, one of the first year fellows, and I'll be giving an imaging conference here today. Uh, just a quick reminder, a little pitch for everyone. Uh, the Philadelphia session of Yanusi Round uh, is going to be held on Monday, November 8th uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern. So check your emails for the links for that. Um, should be a great conference. So let's get started right away with case number one, 52-year-old female who's been reporting some chronic progressive floaters in the left eye and was referred from her outside ophthalmologist for a diagnosis of macular pucker uh, in the left eye. And I think uh, Dr. Shalai, you're doing this first one. So we have a pseudocolor white field fundus photo of the right eye. Uh, central acuity appears intact. The media is clear. The disc has a distinct margin, especially on the temporal aspect. The cuff is small. Uh, there are nice, healthy rims there. The vasculature appear to have normal course and caliber extending to the visualized periphery. Um, our attention is drawn to some segmental areas of hypopigmentation surrounding the vasculature, it appears to be predominantly the veins. So I can see it here along the inferior arcade. Um, some changes here nasally as well. Um, the macula itself appears to be normal, uh, the normal reflex. I don't see any pigmentary changes there and no hemorrhages either. Also, actually, there appears to be some changes to the nasal aspect as well, some what appears to be deep, hypopigmented lesions, uh, just nasal to the disc, a few of them here. What do we think of the disc, that nasal aspect? Uh, it Concerning appears to or? be less distinct um, relative to the temporal side, but I don't see any disc hemorrhages, no cotton wool spot. Um, obviously hard to see if it's elevated mm -hmm. on a two-dimensional image. Yeah, we'll call it equivocal maybe. So similar imaging modality in the left eye, uh, media appears clear. There is this round uh, opacity consistent with possibly a Weiss ring based on its location and appearance. Uh, the disc has a similar appearance here. Temporally, it's sharp and distinct, uh, small cuff, healthy rims. Uh, the vasculature similarly have a normal course and caliber. More prominently on this side, we can see these pigmentary perivascular changes predominantly along the uh, veins. Um, also a hint of those nasal deep, um, deep retinal or choroidal spots here as well. Uh, in addition, the macula has a more blunted uh, appearance to it on this side, probably accounting for the decreased central acuity. And we also see what appears to be two uh, operculated holes in the supratemporal periphery. Uh, there does, they appear to have a very distinct and demarcated appearance to them. I don't see much in terms of subretinal fluid. And the opercula itself appear to have a smaller size compared to the holes, maybe indicating some chronicity, especially in the superior one. Yeah, very good. And uh, on clinical exam, the uh, holes were also noted to have quite a bit of pigment around them. I'm not sure if that comes through on the images or not. So white field uh, autofluorescence imaging of the right eye. Um, overall, the autofluorescence pattern in the posterior pole and visualized periphery appears to be intact. I don't see any gross abnormalities. Similar imaging modality in the left eye. Uh, here, looking at the posterior pole initially, our attention is drawn to this central area, which is hyperfluorescent, hyperautofluorescent relative to the fellow eye probably accounting for those macular changes we were seeing before and consistent with a decreased central acuity. There's some blockage, obviously, from the Weiss ring and the opercula that we have here. And this hole here, which we thought was maybe less chronic, has a hyper autofluorescence pattern to it as well. Okay, can I, can I say, can I ask, so, so the patient's 52. Those arterials are pretty thin, don't you? Don't people think so? I mean, you expect them to thin out and become arterial, uh, or have some arteriolosclerosis, but those seem pretty thin. Is it 
I'm sure we've got a good, not particular, not high myope, if if myopic. So we have a horizontal raster OCT going through the right fovea here. In the infrared image, the reflectance pattern appears grossly within normal limits. On the B scan itself, uh, the vitreous does have some foci of hyperreflectivity, maybe consistent with some cells. And the patient did have floaters as well, so curious if that could be related to it. Um, the retinal laminations themselves appear to be within normal limits, both in the inner and outer retina and uh, the choroid grossly here appears to be intact. I'll clarify the choroid for you a little bit. So on the EDI image, we appear, have to have, we appear to have a normal thickness of the choroid, normal architecture, and the hyaloid seems to be partially attached, so a partial PVD here. Same imaging modality in the left eye. On the infrared reflectance pattern, we see uh, hypo reflectance in the central macula consistent with the changes we've been seeing before. Here on the B scan, we see the reasoning for that. So we have cystoid macular edema, intraretinal fluid uh, in the inner nuclear and outer nuclear layers, in addition to some subretinal fluid and a little bit of an ERM as well. Uh, blunted foveal contour, obviously, and uh, also maybe a few cells in the vitreous here as well. Agreed. EDI image of the same eye shows normal choroidal architecture and thickness and uh, cystoid macular edema as previously noted. We also get a better sense of the extent of the ERM here. We have a white field fluorescein angiogram at 25 seconds in the left eye. We appear to be at laminar phase at this point and we're already starting to get some hyperfluorescence uh, in a peripapillary distribution, also of the disc, and also some what appears to be microvascular or capillary hyperfluorescence. Um, we'll see what happens later on, but they seem to be starting mostly around the veins at this point. So further down 43 seconds, we're at full venous phase at this point, persistent hyperfluorescence as noted before at the disc, and um, capillary beds, again, mostly surrounding the veins at this point. It seems to be getting more prominent than before, suggestive of leakage, also some punctate <coughs> areas of hyperfluorescence uh, here inferiorly and along the edges of that hole, presumably. Excellent. A little further along. Further down, we're getting uh, more leakage here and starting to see the macular leakage uh, consistent with those OCT findings as well. This is the right eye, I'm assuming the, the first image that we have. Correct. Um, full venous phase, uh, we have some hyperfluorescence in a peripapillary distribution, also of the disc, and less prominent um, microvascular leakage. We'll see if we have any later frames. So this is the late frame of the left eye, and we can clearly see the diffuse leakage that we have in a uh, venular and also capillary distribution, also in the macula and the disc. Similar appearance, albeit less prominent in the right eye, so mostly around the veins we're getting some leakage. The disc appears hot. Uh, the macula does not light up uh, as prominently as the left eye. So here's just a little more information about the exam. Obviously, visual acuity, as stated earlier, mildly reduced in the left eye. Uh, there was a PVD in both eyes, and there was a clinical Weiss ring seen on clinical exam in the left eye. Uh, and there was a note of trace cell, not prominent, maybe a little more noticeable on the OCT than was apparent on clinical exam. So at this point, what's on your differential? Yes, yeah, so we have a uh, middle-aged uh, female presenting with floaters and clinical exam compatible with a bilateral retinal vasculopathy predominantly affecting the veins, uh, but also with microvascular leakage in both eyes. Um, 
it will be interesting to know more about the history, but just broad differentials that we could have here are um, infectious and inflammatory is what I would think of. So in the infectious bucket, um, CMV and HIV can classically cause venous involvement. Uh, in addition, TB and syphilis, uh, as well as toxoplasmosis, could, could cause retinal vasculitis. Uh, and in the inflammatory category, things like uh, sarcoidosis, um, something like pars planitis or multiple sclerosis would be something I would ask about in the patient's history. Um, IBD or HLA B27 associated disease. Uh, in addition, birdshot could cause a very similar appearance here. Um, Bichette's disease is what I would think about. And things like GPA could cause a retinal vasculitis. And in an older patient with floaters, uh, in the back of my head, I would also have lymphoma on the differential. Bichette's yeah. is mostly arterial, isn't it? Um, I think correct, but it could cause a mixed pattern as well, or is it just arterial? How about Lyme? I'm going to go along with you. You mentioned pars planitis, which Lyme sometimes has been associated with an intermediate uveitis, so I, th I agree, I think. Those are all, you hit on all the ones that I had thought of and a few additional ones as well. Um, obviously inflammatory like sarcoid, but then also some infectious etiologies. Mm -hmm. Are there any I wouldn't, I wouldn't include toxoplasmosis on that. This is bilateral disease. I mean, you've got some scars in the left eye that, that might be old toxoplasmosis, but toxoplasmosis wouldn't cause this vascular pattern bilaterally. Good point. <clears throat> any additional imaging that you think might clarify this? Yeah, so uh, with some of those differentials being um, primarily choroidal involvement, um, uh, ICG imaging might be helpful here. Right. You had also noted some choroid appearing lesions that have kind of fallen by the wayside on our other imaging. So, was the patient African American or, or Caucasian? Okay, because that really pushes you one way, right? Right. So any thoughts about this? So we have a white field uh, ICG image of the right eye and. Uh, our attention is immediately drawn to areas of hypofluorescence um, in the nasal retina where we were seeing those suspicious lesions, but maybe also in the macula as well. Slightly later frame. Yeah, so uh, you can see it much more clearly here and uh, significantly more than what we were seeing at least clinically. So similar imaging modality in the left eye, we have some blockage from the white spring here, but also similar appearance of these deep um, hypofluorescent lesions in the nasal aspect and also some in the macula as well. So given this new information, do you want to pin down a single diagnosis at this point? I think it's mostly compatible with birdshot just given the appearance of these lesions and the demographics of the patient. Yeah. Any uh, specific laboratory evaluation that you would do? Obviously, the imaging is fairly uh, convincing. Yeah, so for birdshot specifically, it would be uh, HLA testing, A29 in particular. And for the other differentials that we had, um, uh, CBC, quantiferongal testing, and uh, treponemal, non-treponemal testing, maybe a chest x-ray. Yeah, excellent. So uh, she was indeed HLA A29 positive. This is a fairly classic presentation of birdshot chorioretinopathy, which is a bilateral pan-uveitis, though the posterior inflammation is oftentimes more predominant than is the anterior. Um, in fact, KP and posterior sneaky eye are usually absent to the point that some criteria have actually included them as exclusion criteria, though we can talk about whether or not that's um, appropriate. Uh, it's characterized by retinal vasculitis, oftentimes a phlebitis, as was uh, seen in this case. And these yellow, whitish, ovoid, choroidal lesions are kind of the hallmark uh, sign and the finding from which it derives its name of birdshot. Recent uh, data have suggested that this is a Th17 cell driven autoimmune process. Interestingly, one of the uh, biologics, secukinumab, uh, which is an anti-IL-17 uh, agent, uh, was actually 
fairly disappointing uh, in the clinical trials uh, for uh, uveitic conditions, raising the question of, you know, clearly it's more complex than, than just a single uh, mechanism. Uh, but it has been well established that birdshot is strongly associated with HLA A29, and some would go as far as to say it's disease defining. So is HLA A29 truly a sine qua non for this condition, yes or no? There was a set of research criteria, at least set up in 2006, which did include HLA A29 positivity, but only as a supportive finding, not as something that was a requirement for diagnosis. And this was based upon initial reports that said, well, about 95% of birdshot patients test positive for HLA A29. But there is concern that the early antibody tests that were done to establish this number uh, were less sensitive than some of the PCR methods that we now have, which actually may approach closer to 100% of patients with this uh, being HLA A29 positive. So subsequently, authors have suggested that both A29 and maybe also ICGA findings should be required criteria for the diagnosis of birdshot chorioretinopathy. It is worth noting, though, there are patients who are HLA A29 negative with an established diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency who have been shown to present with a birdshot-like syndrome, but in the literature, it's, their care is taken to describe it as birdshot-like, given the fact that A29 seems to be so highly associated with, with classic birdshot itself. I don't think you should have ICGA as a requirement for birdshot retinopathy because it's not birdshot retinopathy or birdshot choroidopathy, it's birdshot chorioretinopathy or retinochoroidopathy. And you can have vascular lesions without the classic choroidal lesions, and you can have choroidal lesions without significant retinal vasculopathy. Um, so I think you know the ICG obviously is going to help if you have a choroidopathy, but I Personally, I wouldn't list it as a, uh, as a required characteristic because of the cases in which the, the retinopathy is the more prominent part. I, you should certainly consider it in a case like this, but my personal thing is you shouldn't make it as a, a requirement. Yeah, so clearly Particularly still in the early onset uh, of disease. Yeah, so clearly still some debate um, even among experts as to <clears throat> what should be and should not be in the criteria. So our patient follow-up, uh, she was immediately started on a oral prednisone taper uh, and then eventually transitioned to oral methotrexate starting at 20 milligrams per week and then bumping up to 25. This is her four-month follow-up OCT, uh, which shows she still has 20-50 vision and there's still quite a bit of subretinal and intraretinal fluid. I guess, Dr. Dunn, maybe I can ask you would you expect her to look a little better at this point, four months of immunosuppressive therapy, or does it sometimes lag behind? Methotrexate can take a long time to kick in. Um, sometimes it'll be six months, but it is disappointing that it's not there. Now, birdshot is one of the really good examples of cases in which immunosuppression um, often isn't just used alone. You have to consider it with other therapeutic options, and I, this would be a good case of a patient with for. Uh, who ought to get a regional steroid injection. You know, it's, the disease is not unilateral, but the fluid is unilateral. Uh, and just as sort of a booster treatment with uh, intravitreal dexamethasone or intravitreal triamcinolone, uh, I think would be a good option here. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> also, it depends, of course, with the status of the inflammation. Uh, you could consider anti-VEGF therapy, but if there's still vitreous cells in there, it's much less likely anti-VEGF therapy is going to work. JP, how do you incorporate ERG into your uh, management? Uh, I think it's really helpful not to send patients for ERG testing. <laughs> I, I mean, personally, I just don't find it that helpful. I think there are other parameters that can be used as adjunctive uh, sort of therapeutic agents, and that can include peripheral visual field testing. Uh, but um, I just haven't found ERG testing helpful. To my more field friends, I disavow knowledge of J.P. Dunn. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason that was brought up, and I think it's a good question, is that um, uh, good work from Moorefields has shown that the B wave is affected substantially. And remember I was talking about how thin those 
arterioles are. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a sign um, that um, there's uh, dysregulation of the vasculature um, within the uh, uh, inner retina. Um, there's um, a lot less inner retinal activity, and so the arterioles thin out. Um, so that is part of the disease, and some people do follow the ERGs, um, uh, especially in England. And these full field or, or multifocal? Full field. So I don't disagree that ERG testing can show abnormalities. I just think there's other less invasive and less expensive ways of monitoring it. And, and I think visual, Goldman visual fields are very important. Um, because you follow the macular edema and gosh, they look better, but that visual field can con continue to constrict. So it's very important in these patients to follow uh, uh, Goldman visual fields. JP, do you agree with that one? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the so-called birdshot Goldman visual field in which you look at the summative uh, fields in 12, is you're looking every 30 degrees, and you sum those up. So you're really not looking at changes in the, in the macula, you know, changes in the blind spot or something like that. What you're looking at is just the total visual field measured in total degrees of those 12 different meridians um, you know, with different isopters. And what you're looking for is expansion of that number. Uh, and I think those can be helpful, and those have been shown in, in studies to correlate with response to treatment. Um, the other thing that's really helpful is just clinically, one of the things asked the patient is, what about their uh, functional vision under scotopic conditions? Because birdshot often really affects night vision. So if you ask a patient, you know, are you able to drive at night, are you able to read a, uh, a menu at a restaurant when the, when the lights are low, and when patients respond, they'll often tell you, oh, it's so much better now. I, I, I can see at night, be, you know, before I was basically blind. And just that alone is a really helpful indicator of good response to treatment. JP, how do you decide between methotrexate and Salcept or Neuro? So there's no controlled clinical trials. Salcept's been used more frequently. The FAST study, which randomized patients to methotrexate and, uh, or uh, Salcept, showed no uh, overall difference in response rates. In subset analyses, there were some potential differences in posterior and pan-uveitis versus intermediate and anterior uveitis in that study. Now, birdshot comprised only a relatively small, well, a very small percentage of patients in that study. It didn't, that study looked at all different types of non-infectious uveitis, not just birdshot. So there aren't any controlled trials of birdshot, uh, of, in birdshot of methotrexate versus Celsept. I think you could use either one uh, but any, if anybody tells you they recommend one versus the other, they're basically on a lack of data. Can, can I tell something that's kind of, <clears throat> for a nerdy person like me, kind of cool? By all means. All right. So there are only two good histopathologic cases of birdshot. One from England of, I think it was a 29-year-old gentleman who died who had birdshot, died in a motor vehicle accident, had a uh, skin melanoma maybe about seven or eight years before um, he um, passed away. The second was by um, myself and my colleagues at Mayo of a patient that had birdshot in both eyes, HLA-29 positive, and a melanoma in one eye, and she elected to have the eye removed. And these are not granulomas. These are focal co collections of T lymphocytes without epithelioid cells. So it's interesting that in both cases, they were Caucasians that had um, been in association with melanomas. All right, thanks very much for that uh, uh, in-depth conversation. Appreciate it. So let's move on to case number two. Uh, this is a 14-year-old male uh, who was actually referred to the genetics clinic here for, quote, missing parts of vision in the right eye. Dr. Sivalingham, would you walk us through this one? Sure. Um, so here we have a wide field color fundus photo of the right eye. Vision is 2400. Media clears clear. Disc margin 
is nice and sharp. Cup to disc is about a 0.4. Vasculature looks overall normal and coarse in caliber. We have a nice nerve fiber layer sheen um, consistent with the patient's age. A um, little bit hard to tell because it's a little dark, but in the macula, we see these kind of multifocal, looks like hyperpigmented lesions scattered in the macula here. Hard to tell if this here is artifact or sheen, this kind of hypopigmented area. And then looking at the visualized periphery, it looks overall normal. So let me clarify the macula, the macula for you a little bit. Oh, perfect, yeah. So here in the macula, we see these multifocal, um, round, hyperpigmented lesions with this kind of hypopigmented halo surrounding them. Um, I don't see any hemorrhages um, and any other relevant changes. Yeah, agreed. And here we have similar modality in the left eye. Vision is 20-30, media is clear. Disc margin is nice and sharp, cup to disc 0.3. Um, vasculature looks normal in its coursing caliber. Nice sheen again. Macula, from what I can see here, looks normal. I don't see any of those similar um, pigmentary changes that we saw in the right eye. And periphery looks normal overall. Yep, so and then another more zoomed in image, again demonstrating relatively normal uh, macula. I will say, I think that the visual acuity here was an uncorrected acuity. Got it. Did you say this was a boy or a girl? Male. Male, okay. Fundus autofluorescence of the right eye. Um, attention is drawn to the macula where we see this kind of granular pattern mix of hypo and hyper autofluorescent pattern um, consistent with those pigmentary changes that we saw in the fundus photo. Um, otherwise, what we can see from the mid periphery looks relatively normal. Yes, I did crop this one. The rest of the periphery looked normal. Perfect. And then here we have the left eye. Overall normal appearance, kind of normal um, hyper autofluorescent appearance of the macula. Okay, so here we have an OCT horizontal scan through the right eye. Looking at the infrared image here, we see redemonstration of those pigmentary lesions. Interestingly, so the halo on the infrared appears hyporeflective, and then we have this these kind of focal areas of hyperreflectance. And then looking at the B scan image itself, vitreous looks clear. Inner retinal laminations look nicely preserved. We have a nice nerve fiber layer here. Um, and then looking at the outer retinal layers, we have significant sudden disruption of the ellipsoid zone um, in the ISOS junction. Um, and then here looking at the RPE, you know, we kind of have these kind of focal areas of um, hyperreflectance, possibly some um, pigment migration. Um, and then almost like a little cleft right here, centrally. And then, um, Kind of shadowing artifact through the choroid, um, but the choroid overall looks normal. And then here we have another horizontal scan, more superiorly through what appears to be the unaffected area of the macula. Looks relatively normal, vitreous again, clear. Inner and outer retinal layers uh, look normal, um, and choroid looks normal. And here we have the left eye horizontal scan. Again, infrared image looks normal, consistent with what we were seeing in the color photo. Vitreous clear. Um, inner and outer retinal layers look nicely well preserved. Choroid looks normal. And just for comparison, left to right. Yeah, so another horizontal scan, kind of more superiorly in the macula, again, looks normal. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Transiting was done of the left eye, so this is the first frame that we have. Got it. Um, so here we have an um, IVFA of the left eye. We're at 58 seconds here. Um, very nice arterial and venous filling. Um, 
the macula looks nice and normal. I don't see any areas of leakage. Um, and visualized periphery looks very, relatively normal as well. Disc looks normal. I don't see any hyperfluorescence to indicate leakage. Good. We do have an ICG. Oh, awesome. So Just briefly summarize. Yeah. So we have an ICG of the left eye. Um, we have nice, normal choroidal filling. I don't see any areas of hyperfluorescence to indicate any abnormal um, choroidal vasculature. Okay, and now we have an image, um, IVFA of the right eye. We're at a minute and 46 seconds. Looking at the macula here, we again see these multifocal um, areas centrally where in the center they look like they're hypofluorescent with a kind of halo of hyperfluorescence. Um, it'd be nice, nice to see how those behave in later frames. Disc looks normal and periphery looks normal. There's this tiny little focal area of hyperfluorescence. And here we have an ICG of the right eye. <clears throat> Good choroidal filling. Um, in the macula, we see these areas of hypofluorescence, almost indicating some type of blockage. Um, but the choroidal vasculature looks overall normal. And just a couple of later frames, as you yeah. asked for. Yeah, so we now have a later frame, five minutes and 11 seconds at the, in the right eye. Um, and these areas of hyperfluorescence, to me, look relatively stable. I don't see any significant leakage um, or pooling. Yeah, absolutely. And again, just to drive home. Yeah, looks so stable. ICG looks relatively stable at five minutes. And then here we have a late frame in the left eye. It looks normal. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what's your differential? Yeah, so we have a young male, 14-year-old, um, with a unilateral pigmentary retinopathy confined to the posterior pole. Um, you know, it's, we're in genetics clinic, but you know, for something inherited, you'd expect to see some changes bilaterally. Um, so I'd like to know a little bit more about the history, you know, possibly some type of recent trauma. Um, I'd like to know if there was any like recent sun gazing, those kind of really well circumscribed pigmentary changes make me think of something like solar retinopathy. Um, you can see similar changes in um, laser associated retinopathy. Um, but certainly since we're in genetics clinic, you always want to, you know, we always can think of those macular dystrophies, so stuff like Stargardt's um, or macular dystrophy, but it, again, it'd be unusual to have only unilateral changes, um, cone or cone rod dystrophies, but again, atypical. Um, you know, sometimes later stages of best disease in kind of the scrambled egg in later stages can have that appearance, but again, he's 14, so you wouldn't really expect that to look like that at that age. Another question um, you could ask is, is he right or left-handed? That plays into which eye is affected. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, less likely in, you know, an old infectious etiology. Um, but those would be the main things I'd be thinking about. Yeah, I think that that's uh, very comprehensive. Um, agreed. You know, the dystrophies are on the list, but again, you would expect to see findings in the other eye. Um, laser retinopathy, solar retinopathy, obviously. I, I added PIC as well, just given the predominance of the posterior pole uh, involvement, um, and then syphilis, uh, toxo scars, uh, and trauma. Just looking a little bit, we do have some longitudinal data, um, and I would suggest that as we look from initial presentation to seven-month follow-up, the lesions are slightly less prominent. A little unusual for that to be the case in a progressive dystrophic sort of condition. I think similar argument could be made for the autofluorescence, which similarly shows a little bit of some fading of the abnormalities over time. A little hard to say on the OCT whether or not uh, at the seven-month time point there truly is a little bit of reconstitution of some of the outer retinal layers, just temporal to this line that I've uh, put up there. But again, not aside from the increase in the clefting and the decrease in the pigmentary change, certainly not a progressive uh, loss. So this is a case of laser-induced 
retinopathy, oftentimes self-induced, but has also been reported children playing games with laser pointers, unfortunate accidents off of mirrors, but frequently is a self-induced uh, pathology. Uh, and it's a recognized public health concern, uh, especially among children where many of these cases uh, are seen. There are varying manifestations to what a laser can do to the retina, and as retina specialists, we probably realize that. Um, the vitelliform-like maculopathy with these pigmentary changes is often seen, though there are also case reports of macular hole and preretinal hemorrhage, especially with the blue lasers, which have a higher energy deliverance in a short amount of time. There is also a wide spectrum of presenting visual acuities, again, kind of depending on the extent of damage that has been done. And it's oftentimes challenging to elicit a history of laser exposure, especially in children. They may not come forward and say, yes, I've been playing with this laser pointer like mom and dad told me I shouldn't. Or sometimes they don't even know um, that you know, what they're doing uh, can, can be potentially uh, damaging. A uh, review uh, had published that you can see visual acuities follow, uh, you know, following laser pointer injury can be anywhere from count fingers to as good as 20-20, depending on where the lesions are. Um, and there, again, is a wide distribution of, of what is seen on exam, ranging from these yellow foveal lesions to hemorrhage to pigment changes to frank macular holes. There is a case, a case series, rather, that was published that did try to classify OCT findings into a scale of mild, moderate to severe uh, retinopathy. The mild includes just focal uh, outer retinal changes, as seen in this image. Uh, moderate was described as, again, just outer retinal changes, but in a more diffuse pattern. And then the severe uh, included this um, migration or involvement of the uh, more inner retinal layers, not just the outer retina though no effort or comment was made about whether or not these severity scales have any bearing on prognosis or even initial visual acuity. Brief point about laser classes. So when we talk about laser pointers, lasers do get classified based on the amount of power output. The older classification from the 1970s uh, is shown here. The typical laser pointers, and for those who have laser pointers, if you look at them, uh, it likely says grade 3A. Those are supposed to be 5 milliwatt output or less. Um, and that is the upper limit of what is allowed to be legally sold within the United States uh, commercially. This classification system was actually updated in the 2000s to involve a few more uh, classification categories. The 3A is now actually called 3R. Again, that is less than 5 milliwatts of, of output. However, there, it is known that there is rampant mislabeling of the actual power output of these devices. A study was done in 2013 that tested 122 laser pointers, some of which were just in the possession of the National Institute of Standards and Technology and several others that were acquired uh, from online vendors. And they tested the actual power out uh, output of these devices. All of the devices were labeled as class 3R, so within the uh, 5 milliwatts or less. And they found that of green laser pointers, nearly 90% of them actually had a higher output than was labeled on the device. And red lasers, uh, roughly half of them, uh, had a higher output than one would expect. And if you look at the actual wavelengths, the dotted red line is what the kind of legal standard is for uh, what it would be acceptable as a 3A uh, laser. You can see that many of the devices far exceeded this. And interestingly, the green laser pointers don't just emit at a single wavelength. They also emit infrared um, uh, radiation uh, as well. So you may or may not recognize this image from ophthalmology retina just last month. This is an example of terrible laser-induced retinopathy. Anyone have any comment about why it takes this sort of morphology with these linear sort of patterns? Blinks. And, and what happens when the blinks? Right, so it's thought that this is related to the Bell's reflex, that you get these vertical excursions as the laser's there and the eye moves, um, that you get these kind of linear patterns. 
Is there treatment for this? Some people have proposed some treatments, including case reports where corticosteroids uh, have been uh, tried. Um, the thought being that this may attenuate some of the cytokine cascade or prevent RPE proliferation, which could further damage down the road. Uh, the use of oral lutein, um, given its antioxidant or anti-inflammatory properties, has also been described in at least one case report. And then surgery for certain uh, manifestations, specifically those uh, like full thickness macular holes or those that have subhyloid hemorrhages, might benefit from vitrectomy, ILM peel, and possibly also a YAG hyaloidotomy to drain hemorrhage. And again, as I mentioned, these have mostly been reported with the blue wavelength uh, laser injuries. There's a couple of series published uh, from Saudi Arabia uh, that uh, talks about this nicely. So any final thoughts about laser retinopathy? Um, I know we're coming up I close love how, to the end here. Um, Dr. Shields asked uh, if the patient was a boy or a girl. Um, or, and um, I, I think the Y chromosome just makes you do stupid things. <laughs> and uh, I always ask kids also, like, do you have brothers and sisters? If they have a brother, that's a bad sign. <laughs> and I think studies have actually shown that having male siblings is a risk factor for trauma, and this is kind of categorized under trauma, you know? So just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing I've gotten where I have. <laughs> Can you go back to that um, pic, uh, cover picture? Yeah, so, but there are um, not only li vertical lines this way, there's vertical lines this way. So um, the way I look at this, this is like the ultimate in microperimetry because um, as you, um, lose first they fixate centrally and as they fi uh, lose their fixation centrally their preferential locus of fixation goes further and further out and if it um, and that's what I think one is seeing is their preferential locus of fixation that they destroy each time well excellent so again I think in the interest of time I don't want to short shrift the Last case, which is, I think, another one that deserves some good discussion, if that's all right with you, Dr. Sivalingham. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, um, for the good discussion. I was hoping that they would generate a lot of good, good thoughts. So thanks.